movement is somewhere between an organization on one end and protest on the other end. So it's some, some sort of a hybrid, it's somewhere in the middle. You know, it has high participation. Movements have to have high participation and the creativity with it. And a lot of people recognizing it as their own and taking part in that, similar to the protest. But, on the other hand, it has to have the longevity. It has to be long term, like the organization. It has to have the identity so that people recognize it. It's not the same as the identity of an organization, but it is more than an identity of the protest. The people understand who these people are and what they want to achieve. Another thing is that protest usually has demands. So people protest in order to demand something. Organizations, on the other hand, have goals. They set their goals. So movements, in that sense, resemble organizations more. They, they're not about demands. Because demand is, you know, you want the other side to do something. So that's your demand. You demand them. You demand that they do something. But the goal means that you want to do it. So you're going to do it regardless of what the opponent is up to. So in that sense, movement resembles uh, organization more. In terms of tactical aut autonomy, and people, we call it spontaneity, but also tactical autonomy, that people can actually do things on their own without asking the leadership, can we do this or what are we going to do? In that sense, movement resembles a protest more. So, you know, when we are building movements, we are actually not looking at the 3.5% or we're looking at, uh, you know, is this, uh, how shall I say, uh, particular uh, condition met in the society or not. What we are engaging in is practical politics. It's practical building of a movement. And we have to answer very practical questions about... Uh, how are we going to organize, what kind of level of the autonomy we're going to have, what are, what are going to be our strategies to involve people, what Macha was saying about participation being the key, how do we bring people in, etc., etc. So these are the practical questions that we have. And so the first practical question is actually how do we formulate grievances? Because grievances are going to be the first step in, mo in movement building. And so, in order to kind of explain the, the, the problem of formulating grievances, we're going to use one little story. So imagine you live in a house on the top of a hill. There is no human uh, living nearby. You're alone on top of the hill. There's no water, no electricity, nothing. Complete isolation. So every morning you wake up, and then you go around and collect firewood around the house to, to build some fire. Then you walk down the hill to the nearby river to collect water for your house. You come back, you know, everything that you have to, uh, that you can eat, you have to find uh, somewhere in the, in, the, in the woods. So you spend most of your day actually trying to, 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 to survive. And how many of you would uh, agree that this constitutes a hard life. Any, does anybody think this is a hard life or is it an easy life? Huh? Hard life? Okay. We have few people who think it's hard. Who, how many of you think this is an easy life? Okay, you, you're a real environmentalist. <laughs> okay, so let's ask a question. If you, if you live in such a house, do you have any grievance? It's like, is there anybody that caused this life for you? Is there anybody to blame here? Hmm? Who would you blame? Hmm? Is, there a, is there a grievance associated with it? Well, that's, the, that's exactly. So imagine you live in the same house without electricity, without water, without... You go out, collect firewood, you go out to the nearby river to collect wood to collect water, but then all around you there are people living like an urban life. So the, your hardship is the same, but suddenly you feel like you're cheated. You're not part of something that everybody else enjoys. So suddenly you feel grievance. You feel that you need somebody to blame. So the, 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 the point being that hardship is not a guarantee for a movement. 
people can live really bad lives. They can live in poverty, they can live in malnutrition, they can live, but they can think, this is the way it is, there's nothing I can do about it. They can live without any freedom, they can live without any opportunity in life, and still they say, ah, that's the way it is, there's nothing I can do about it. So the first thing that the movements do is actually to formulate these grievances. Formulating grievances means that this isn't the way things should be. Things could be different. And the reason why they're not different is because there's somebody who is part of the problem and, and, and this, is, this is where hardship is formulated as a grievance and this is the, how should I say, the basis for a, for a, for a struggle. And we, need, we need to struggle to change that. So then, the next question, after we formulate grievances, the next question for the movement to answer is, how do we move from grievance to action? So it's not just enough to, be, to feel aggrieved that, you know, somebody is not treating us the way we should be treated, but we need to actually do something about it. And then, when we make that uh, uh, next step, the question is, what kind of action? Is it institutional action or extra-institutional action? And what people first, when they feel aggrieved, the first thing they do usually is take institutional road. So they write a petition. They try to kind of, uh, you know, uh, do a redress or they are trying to explain that, you know, this is not right. But that works if the institutions work, but if the institutions are rigged, if the institutions are used to perpetuate the system, then institutional road doesn't work. And so then, the next question is, do we go, the institutions don't work, do we go around these institutions, or do we go against them? Do we pressure these institutions to change? Going around institutions, in a lot of cases where institutions don't work, people go around the institutions. You know, they do the bribing, and you know, like, you know somebody inside, they will help you, so you practically Engaging in, in corruption is actually a, a like a, a how should I say a perfectly logical thing to do in a society or in a country where institutions don't work because you have to you have to survive you have to do the things that, that are that are needed so if that means that you know just you know keep quiet give money to whoever and like let's go let's continue but there is also the possibility to go against these institutions. If they are not uh, working, we can also go against them. And then finally, if we decide to go against the institution, then another thing that the movement needs to decide, how are we going to go against the institutions? Are we going to do it violently or non-violently? And in some cases, you know, people decide to use violence. And in the case of a movement, if the movement wants to remain popular and, and broad-based, they have to, they have to uh, choose the non-violent path. This means that there are so many questions here where a movement can, uh, how shall I say, uh, make a mistake. You know, first in formulating grievances, if the movement fails to formulate the grievance, I'll give you an example. I talked to some uh, uh, people in, uh, in Tanzania recently, so they have this forum called Jamia Forum, and, uh, and this is like an online gathering place for, for dissidents, you know, who are trying to uh, engage with, uh, uh, with, with citizens and, uh, you know. And so they're facing uh, restrictions in, uh, with freedom of, freedom of speech. So they went out to kind of try to get the ordinary citizens on board to defend the freedom of speech. And the ordinary citizens told them that freedom of speech, freedom of the press, that's a rich man's problem. So, that's the first problem. How do you define your grievances? Are those grievances the grievances of a small group of people or are they grievances of the, of the big po uh, part of the population? The next, pro the next thing that, that, you know, when you take this uh, action, in many cases, people 
try to do it in the institutional way. And then, you know, they keep hitting the, 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 the wall and they cannot make any progress because uh, institutions are rigged against them. I mean, for, for, for that matter, uh, I was, uh, uh, back in the 90s, uh, we had like a, a student protest, I talk about, I'll talk about it uh, later, but uh, after the student protest that was kind of the first, my first entry into, into activism, we uh, all student activists got and uh, got elected into the student parliament. So we became part of a student institution. And then we decided to fight the government by, you know, using, utilizing the student parliament. That conflict ended by the government abolishing the, the, the student part of parliament and outlawing the, that institution. You know, so this was our attempt to do institutional politics, you know. You, how shall I say, it, 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 there are many ways to, 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 to make a mistake. So the bad news for, that I have for you is that building a movement is not easy. There are so many things that, that need to be done and there are so many ways that, that things can, can go wrong. So in that sense, it's not an easy thing. So that's bad news. Good news is that running a regime is also not easy. And, you know, it's not like that the authoritarians are like, you know, oh, you guys just go and like arrest 5,000 people and you guys just go and sack all... That is also difficult, you know. In, and, and if there is any, how shall I say, uh, how should I say, reason to be hopeful is that whatever problems we have trying to build a movement, they also have problems trying to, to maintain uh, the regime. And so, let me, let me just kind of uh, spend some time on the, on the dynamic of this, because I think this is important also from an experiential point of view. When we look at our experience, how do we make these movements? Because yes, we have to answer these questions, formulate grievances, kind of formulate action and all that stuff, that's all fine. But like, how does that look in, in reality? You know? So usually when you look at uh, like a country, you, know, you have a, a struggle that is going on, and that struggle can be a struggle for democracy, it can be a struggle for racial equality, like it was in, the, let's say, South Africa, uh, throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It can be a struggle for independence. It doesn't matter. But what, what is, regardless of what is the, the, the goal of the struggle, what we can say about it is struggles take years, if not decades. You know, if we look at all these big struggles that were taking place in history, these were all multi-generational struggles. It wasn't that one generation started it, and the same generation ended it. It was usually started by one generation and ended uh, successfully by uh, one or two generations later. So we have struggle as the, as the longest, uh, let's say, the longest time frame. And if we look at it within that struggle, we can point to certain periods of high mobilization followed by periods where nothing was happening, or it looked like nothing was happening. So we can see certain protests, certain mass, mass mobilization uh, happening in those, in those uh, cases. And also, you know, we can see periods where movements were active in, in these struggles. So, you know, and in some cases, you know, these movements were connected to that mass mobilization. They were the ones who were doing this mobilization and bringing people, bringing people into the streets. And also, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna focus so much on this, but also another thing that we can do, that we can see is the, uh, is the campaigns that they were running. So within the struggle, we have movements, campaigns, we have protests. These are all different expressions of the, of the, of the, some sort of activism. But let's try to see how they, how they interplay. So I'm going to use three examples, and I'm going to start because we're in Kiev. I'm going to use the first example is going to be the uh, early 2000s. So there was in 2001, and I remember because we just finished uh, our struggle with, uh, with Milosevic, 
and we were watching videos from, from Kiev, there was this like mass mobilization with like really kind of dramatic footage coming from Kiev with the police beating people and they're coming back into the, into the square, fighting back and, and staying there. That was Ukraine without Kuchma, which happened after the murder of the journalist Gongadze. And although this was a, a mobilization that was significant, it didn't produce the desired result. So the things kind of, uh, a little bit of a crackdown, a little bit of a burnout, people couldn't do it anymore, so it faded away. But what happened is that people, some of the people, for them, this was the first, their first experience with street politics and the very first experience with street actions. And so after it faded away, they stayed in touch, no, 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 uh, continued the conversation, they were thinking about like, what are the other ways we can do, what are the different uh, lessons that we got from this, what are, what are the ways we can improve or change. And what happened is that those people, a few years later, were instrumental as activists in the, in the Orange Revolution. So what looked like an attempt that led nowhere, what we don't see underground happening is that reorganizing, recombining, and then coming back and in, in another form. And if we look at, uh, let's say, Egypt under Mubarak, similar thing, 2005, Kifaya. So there was, that was a very strong mobilization happening, but uh, Mubarak regime was still very strong managed to crush them, they went underground, nothing happened, people were disillusioned, but they stayed in touch, they became friends, these were some people who, and, who went into the streets and they, they were protesting for the first time, they never did it before, so they stayed in touch, they started regrouping around 2008, and by 2011, another mobilization, and this time they, they managed to unseat Mubarak, so we see the same same pattern. Serbia, well, this is my experience. So my first protest that I was involved in was in 1991. I was still in high school, but I was just like going there, like, you know, not really, not really active. My, uh, the same thing is with 1992. And then in 1996, this was the protest that I, that I got involved in. And I was part of it. And it lasted for four months, and it was great. We were protesting mar daily marches every day for four months, and then parties during the night, and it was great, you know. But it, uh, it was, uh, in the end, it was a failure. We didn't succeed. And so what we had following that was regrouping. We had that episode when we tried to do things through the student parliament. It didn't work. But we were regrouping, and then finally, by 98 and 99, we regrouped into Otpor, the resistance movement, and then came back. So what was started in 1991 by people who were older than us, we were still in high school, was essentially finished by us. So it's a kind of multi-generational multi uh, struggle. So, what is, the, uh, what is the bottom line here? So what we can see from this is that, you know, this is not a one-off. First, we have to look at the larger struggle and the continuity of that struggle. And we also have to see how people who are coming into the struggle are learning from the previous, uh, from the people who are already there and from the mistakes they did and from the things that they did well and how they're building on the, on the things that were, that were done before. So in a sense, what we originally would see, like when we started as isolated uh, events of mobilization, now we can draw the line and see how that they all lead to something. But as you can see, it takes, it takes years. So one of the things that is happening here is that people are trying to figure out the answers to the following Questions: How do we transition? And this is all, everybody that I talked to that was involved in one of those protests and later moved on to build the movement. They were grappling with with these questions: How do we move from reaction to action? So Ukraine without Kuchma, that was a reaction to the murder of Gongadze. 
They went into the street as a reaction to an outside event. So how do we move, instead of reacting to what government did, how do we initiate actions? How do we, be, how do we become the ones who are making the first move and let the opponent react to that? So that's the first question. The second is, how do we move from grievance to action? Actually, how do we mobilize people, not just to feel aggrieved, but also to do something about it? That's key for, to what Mace was referring to, per, civic participation. Because if people can do that, then uh, you know, they, will, they will join the, the movement. And then, how do we move from demands to goals? How do we, instead of demanding more, how should I say, we demand democracy. But when we, when we move to the goal, we are defining what does that mean to achieve democracy? What are the things that we need to build ourselves to reach that goal? So we need to have a functioning political parties that we can build ourselves. We need to have, let's say, NGOs that are capable of monitoring elections. This is something that we can build. We need media, so we need to build independent uh, maybe underground media, but you know. So when, when we move from demands to goals, we're not waiting for the other side to give us something, we're actually building that. And what we will uh, talk about, I think, tomorrow also is the, these parallel institutions that, 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 that can be built. If, 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 the, if the, there is no other way, some movements build totally parallel institutions. And then finally, how do we move from tactics to strategy? Because protest in itself is a tactic, and uh, you know this is what uh, uh, how shall I say uh, is happening like ad hoc, and usually it's very spontaneous. But it's not a sequence of of, of events, sequence of, of of tactics. So when protest becomes a movement. From a tactical point of view, it's moving to a long-term strategic point of view. So what do we do? What do we want to see in six months, in a year? What are we going to do in the next four weeks? What are we going to do after that? So people start thinking differently. So this is where uh, like all these uh, movements had actually to answer, to answer uh, this question.